What an honor and a privilege it is to be in God's presence today as we look and read through the book of Psalms, chapter number 72, all through to chapters number 77. I want to believe that it's going to be a wonderful time as well in God's presence as we hear what the Word of God has to say. Let us be reminded that faith comes by hearing and by hearing by the Word of God. And every single time that you're exposed to God's Word, you give it um, at uh, the time to meditate upon it, to allow it to rest in your heart, to resonate with it, and to let it shape your desires. You are filling your life with the word of God, which will, which will in turn produce a faith in your life as well as mine. So today, uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, read. As you look, as I've said, uh, Psalms chapter 72, uh, all through to chapters number 77, and I believe we can start with the word of prayer as the Holy Spirit leads us through from there. Father, our Heavenly Father, what an honor, what a privilege it is to be called your children. Lord, we are such delighted. And Lord, we are so, so happy just to be in your presence, to read your word, to have a time to hear what your voice has to say into our lives today. Lord, I pray for any one of us who's fighting personal battles here and there, may your hand be upon them. May, you, may, may your strength be upon them. May they know that the God who fought for David, the God who fought for Israel, the God who protects his people from, uh, from calamities, from enemies, from sicknesses, from diseases, that is still the same God you are alive. And Lord, you never failed in the past, neither will you start failing now. I pray that all of us, King of Glory, will be in a place you know, to receive your voice as you speak to us today. For it is in Jesus' name we do trust, praying, and believing. Amen. Psalms chapter number 72, verses 1, it says, Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. This is a son of, Solom uh, Psalm of Solomon, by the way. So he will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. The mountains will bring peace to the people. And the little hills by righteousness. He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy. And will break in pieces the oppressor. So Psalm 72 is a, is a psalm of uh, the son of David, which is uh, Solomon. He's talking about you know, the inquiring of wisdom and understanding in leading the people of Israel. And in the same manner as you continue to read, you'll also discover that it is a messianic psalm in its own context and in its own right. So he says this, verses 5, They shall fear you as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generation. Verses 6, It shall come down like rain upon the grass before mowing, like showers that water the earth. In his days the righteous shall flourish and abundance of peace. Until the moon is no more. Verses 8. He shall have dominion from where? From sea to sea. And from the river to the ends of the earth. The Bible says. Those who dwell in the wilderness will bow before him. And his enemies will lick the dust. The kings of Tashish and the isles will bring presents. The king of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Who else is this other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? For he will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also and him who has no helper. He will spare the poor and needy and will save the souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence and precious shall be their blood in his sight. And he shall live, and the gold of Asheba will be given to him. Prayer also will be made for him continually, and daily he shall be praised. There will be an abundance of grain in the earth. On the top of the mountain its fruits shall wave like Lebanon. Those of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall continue, he says. As long as the sun and men shall be blessed in him, all nations shall call him blessed. 
who other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever. Let the whole heart be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. You see, his name shall endure forever and ever, verse 17. You know, the scripture tells us in the book of Philippians that he was given the name that is above every other name. And by that name, every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Every knee in heaven and earth shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. 73. Truly God is good to Israel. To such as are pure in heart, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious and jealous, and uh, I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Look at that word. And he says, Truly God is a God of Israel. No doubt about that. To such as 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 are pure, pure in heart. So he is their God. True to that. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. What made him to stumble? The steps are uh, to, to stumble. His steps are nearly to come to a point of slipping. For I was envious. Losing focus on his God, he started looking at those who are wicked, those who are proud, those who are boastful. He says, for I was envious. Of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now he forgets that God is his God. He forgets that God is the God of Israel. He forgets that God is good to those who are uh, pure in heart. Why? Because his focus has, has shifted from God. And he's looking at the wicked and he's seeing the boastful. How they are prospering. And he was so envious about them. For there are no pangs, he says, in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return here and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. So the ungodly looks and he says, who is God? And even if he's there, he's in heaven. Can he hear us? Can he see us? What you're doing? In other words, the wicked are not God conscious. That's why they choose to do anything they can do. Remember the three days ago we were looking at that issue? That when wickedness enters your heart, is to have this feeling that God is not watching you. That's where it all starts. That you're not God conscious. Remember Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter number 5? They could lie to Peter, not knowing the actual line to the Holy Spirit. Not only knowing that the Spirit of God was with them. Wasn't the Spirit of God with them when they were selling the land? And all the produce they had, it was theirs. The money they had, the receipts of they had, or the money they had was theirs. And so they were not oblivious of the fact that, that the Holy Spirit was seeing them. And whenever we enter into sin, that's the first thing that happens. You, you stop becoming Holy Spirit conscious or God conscious. So the wicked are saying, listen, therefore, how does God know? Because even if he's God, he's not everywhere. You know, for them, it's like, uh, you know, when you have the image of Balia, you say, this is the image of Baal. This is my God is Balia. So Baal is here where I am in Kajiado County, Kitengela. So if I move out of Kajado County, perhaps, and I go to the next uh, county, which is Machakos here in Nathi River, you're saying God is, is back. The, 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 the idol is back at, at Kitengela. So here in, 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 in Nathi River, he does not see what I'm doing, so I am free. 
because they have forsaken that God as the qualities of omnipresence is everywhere. He is omniscient. He knows everything. So when you have that in your heart, when you have the sense of feeling that God is not with you, you will have the liberty to do anything you feel for in, 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 your, in, in, in your own right that it is permissible for you to do. Verse 15. You know, that in surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastised every morning. If I had said I would speak thus, behold, I would have been un it would have, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to under how to understand this, I was it was too painful for me. Then verse 17, it turns everything around and it says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. In other words, these things are so mind-boggling for me to see how the wicked live, how they are boastful, how they walk in abundance and plenty. They seem not to lack anything. Uh, you know, isn't that what, what you see? Uh, where we live, there are um, bars and clubs that are mushrooming all over. And uh, you'll pass by in the middle of the night, coming from prison, and you'll see uh, cars parked at these clubs, you know, numerous in number and you wonder what people can stay here spend money here have all they want the fun they want to have here but then in the churches when you go to the car parks of the churches and if it's a friday night when you're supposed to have vigils people are not there it's like the wicked just enjoy their wickedness but the righteous don't enjoy in walking in righteousness or pursuing after god and so this thing it was mind-boggling for the psalmist and he feels that, you know, this thing is too big for me. And then he changes all and he said, but I understood this when I entered into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood the end. When you get before God, there is an understanding and enlightenment, enlightenment that enters your life. You start understanding things in a way, in, in a godly manner. You start seeing things from the end. You start looking at the end of the matter. You remember that the race is not to the to, to the to the swift, no battle to the strong. You know, you look at the end of the wicked, you discover, do you know what? They may be enjoying now, but their end is determined. And so there is no need to be envious of the person who's living in a wicked manner. There is no need to be envious to the person who's walking in wickedness and they are still stubborn or they are boastful about it. Their end is known. So is the end of the righteous. So don't look at the people who are wicked and look at their prosperity, look at how they're walking in abundance and feel, do you know, I think I made a mistake to follow after God. You never made a mistake. Walk with God without complaint. Walk with him in understanding and the God of all righteousness, the God who rewards in his due time, he will reward you. Remember, your righteousness does not affect God, it affects you. When you walk uprightly before God, you are conscious of his presence. You experience him. You walk with him. You can hear his voice. You can experience his leading in your life. Something that the wicked don't have the opportunity to enjoy. So surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to dissolution as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so the Lord, when you awake, he shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. When revelation is not present, frustration becomes the order of the day. He says, because of my ignorance, because he lacked the revelation of the end of, the, of, of, of those who are wicked, was frustrated because he didn't have that revelation and that understanding so his spirit was vexed nevertheless i am continually with you you hold me you hold me by my right hand you will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory so he says the end of the wicked is this but those who walk in understanding and revelation they are led by you they are led by your counsel and you know what he says and afterwards they shall be received to your glory be the name of the living God. So the end of the wicked is known. 
the end of the righteous is known. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon, uh, upon, upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He desires God because he knows it is in God that he has his strength. For indeed those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for hallowed tree. So the people who pursue after other gods, the people who pursue after pleasure, the people who pursue after money in uh, uh, you know, regardless of the relationship of God and they forsake the relationship of God, what, 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 what do they undergo? They undergo destruction. He says, you have destroyed all those who desert you for hollow tree. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God. That I may declare all your work. Listen, for it is good to draw near to God as a sense of trusting Him. And then what will be the result? The result is this, that, you know, first I'm drawn to God, intimacy with Him, trust that is faith, with, faith in God. And as you have faith and trust in God, what does it produce? It produces declaration to the generations around you. In other words, when you're intimate with God, when you trust Him, you've got testimonies that you can acknowledge before your peers, before your generation. Praise be the name of the living God. 74 verses 1. Oh God, why have you cast us off forever? He says. Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pastures? Remember your congregation which you have purchased of old, the tribe of your inheritance which you have redeemed. So he acknowledges, listen, we are not a nation that belong to ourselves. We are a nation that have been redeemed and that is a price that has been paid for us. This Mount Zion where you have dwelt, lift up your feet to the perpetual desolations. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. Your enemies roar in the midst of your meeting place. In other words, they have invaded the sanctuary. They are making shouts and roaring and speaking victory in the sanctuary of God. They set up their banners for signs. In other words, the name of Yahweh is no longer the banner in his sanctuary. They have started putting their own logos there, their own declarations there as their own signs in the sanctuary and the temple of the Holy One. They seem like men who lift up axes among the thick trees. And now they break down its carved work all at once with axes and hammers. They have set fire to your sanctuary. They have defiled the dwelling place of your name to the ground. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them all together. They have burned up all the meeting places of God in the land. You know, when your enemy wants to destroy you, it goes to your place of worship or to your sense of belief, to the place of your heart where you have enthroned your God. To dethrone him. To make sure that you don't have a place that symbolizes, you know, your source of strength, your source of health, because that's what the sanctuary was. Remember when uh, Solomon was dedicating it, he was saying when your people are in battle and your people are being attacked and they come to this place or face towards this place and they make a prayer, Lord, listen to them. Give them the strength in battle. So what does the enemy do here? And the psalmist records, he says, the enemy has come. They have taken charge over your, your sanctuary. They have defiled it. They have brought it down. Why? Because the sanctuary was a, sense, was, was a source of hope to the children of uh, Israel. So we do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet. Now, there is no one to comfort because the work of a prophet is to comfort and to give divine direction. So he says, there is no longer any prophet, nor is there any amongst us who knows how long this will continue. Ten. Oh God, how long will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? Take it out of your bosom and destroy them. For God is my king from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. 
You broke the heads of the sea serpents in the water. You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave him as a food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. You broke open the fountain and the flood. You dried up mighty rivers. The day is yours. The night is also yours. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have set all the borders of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, and that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. Oh, do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of the poor forever. Have respect to the covenant, he says, for the dark places of the earth are full of the hounds of cruelty. Oh, do not let the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise your name. What a statement here, he says, verses 20. Have respect to the covenant. Really? Really? You're telling God to have respect on the covenant? Yet, the enemies are walking in your sanctuary because you yourselves did not respect the covenant. The children of Israel were being attacked. The, the, the sanctuary was being, you know, under siege, was being defiled because the people who are called the people of God, who had a covenant with him, they never kept is their part of the covenant. So it is, it is, it is, it is such a um, contradiction here to hear this person saying, have respect to the covenant. Is he trying to tell it to God or is he trying to remind the people uh, who had broken the covenant? Because it's like trying to tell God, God, remember you have a covenant with these people. You have a covenant with this house. Please, can you remember it? Can you respect it? Can God really disrespect his covenant without first the person who, you know, without the children of Israel first deserting the covenant themselves? That's what they did. They forsook the covenant. They, they, they failed to fulfill their part of the covenant. And God was not obliged to keep his part. Then it says, Arise, O God, plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you, you daily. Do not forget the voice of your enemies. The Talmud of those who rise up against you increases continuously. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your wondrous works. Declare that your name is here. When I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all its habitants are destroyed. I set up its pillars of family. I said to the boastful, do not deal boastfully, and to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with a stiff neck. For exaltation comes neither, he says, from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. So he says exaltation, being lifted up, being uh, you know, glorified, being um, remembered, you know, being uplifted, does not come from the, not from the south, neither from the east or the west. It comes from God above. He's the one who says the proud I despise, the humble I lift up. So when God promotes, when the, there's a promotion, the promotion does not come from anyone else. It comes from the God, from God himself, who is the judge of what we do, how we speak, and how we live. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, and it's fully mixed, and it pours, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob, he says. All the horns of the wicked I will also cut off, and the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. In other words, when the wicked and those who are not righteous try to exalt them, themselves, try to uplift themselves, try to make themselves, because, um, you know, by pride and boastful, thinking they own the earth. Remember the Bible tells us the meek shall inherit the earth. No matter how wicked a man is, we have stories of people who are wicked and we knew the end of the matter. And yet we have seen the people who have walked in righteousness, even the modern, in the, in the, in the, in the modern setup, 
and we have seen how the Lord has lifted up, how their memories has, has outlasted, you know, the memories of the wicked. So when the boastful think that they are rising up, the Bible says their horns will be cut off, but the righteous shall be done what? They shall be exalted. At the end of the day, the righteous will have the final love. In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem, also in his tabernacle, and his dwelling place in Zion. There he broke the arrows of the bow, the shield, than the sword of battle. You are more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The south hearted were plundered. They have sunk into their sleep. And none of the mighty men have found the use of their hands. Of their hands at your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and the horse were cast into a de dead sleep. Verse 7 You yourself are to be feared, and who may stand in your presence when once you are angry? He says, God, you are to be feared. Who could dare to stand in your presence when you are so angry? When you look at sinful man and you look at the holy God, you see the discrepancies between man and his maker. How man is wicked. He says in the book of Genesis chapter number 6, seeing that man's heart is wickedness, my spirit shall not contend with him forever. That man has been wicked, but God has been holy. Remember when Isaiah saw him in Isaiah chapter number 6, he says, Ah, oh, I have seen the Lord, for I am a man of unclean lips, living amongst the people of unclean lips. So when the, the image of God, the understanding of God is that God is a holy God. And in his holiness, he sees the sin of man and he becomes angry towards man. So the psalmist writes and he says, who can stand in his presence knowing very well that you are angry? Thank God, for we have a mediator who stands between the wicked man and the righteous God. This name of this mediator is the man Christ Jesus himself. He takes away the right, the anger of God. He wipes away the sins of the world. He wipes away your sin and my sin. Those who choose to put their faith and their trust in him. And so when God looks down on the earth of sinful men, his anger is not arose, is not arose because he sees not the sins of man, but the blood of his son Jesus Christ. You caused judgment to be heard from heaven, and the earth feared and was still. When God arose to, arose to judgment to deliver all the oppressed to the earth, surely the wrath of man shall praise you. With a reminder of wrath, you shall guard yourself. Verses 11. Make vows to the Lord your God and pay them. Let all who are around him bring presents to him who ought to be feared. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is awesome to the kings of the earth. 77. I cried out to God with my voice. To God with my voice. And he gave ear to me. In the day of my troubles, what did he do? I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without a season. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was uh, troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. In his search for God, he never rested. He pursued God. He looked for God. He stretched out his hands during the night. When he was wondering and pondering about God, you know, there was no one there to comfort him. Why? Because he was only seeking for the comfort that comes. From the one he was he, 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 from, from the one who is called his God. Do you have such an appetite for God? Do you have such an appetite to seek after him? Remember the book of Hebrews, chapter number eleven, uh, says what? That without faith it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please God. For whoever comes to him must first believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder. Of what kind of people? The people who diligently do you have such a diligence in seeking God? Is prayer your, your, your lifestyle, your depth, of, of, or, or, or your ways of you know, trying to pursue God through the avenue of prayer day and night, having personal night vigils in order for you to seek God, to find Him, to walk with Him, to experience Him? 
saying, do you know what? I will not be comforted with material stuff. I will not be comforted with the progress in my life. Sorry, I will not be comforted by the job that I just got. got. I will not be comforted just because I've got married and I have children. But the only sense of comfort that I will rest with and I will let it find its harbor in my life is to find is the comfort that comes from finding the God that I seek. That's what he's trying to say, to say here. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart, and my spirit makes diligence. Will the Lord cast off forever, and will he be favorable no more? As his mercy ceased forever, as his promises failed forevermore. Has God forgotten to be gracious? As he in anger shut up his tender mercies? He's inquiring. He's wondering the way things are. Has the nature of God changed? The nature of God changes not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He changes God. It changes not. God changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We may change, we may forsake him, but God never changes. And I say, this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. He says, I can, you know, I am, I am in anguish, having this mind, thinking, has God really forsaken me? Has God changed? Is his nature changing? But he says, this is what I will let it be a memory or abide in my mind, the ears of the right hand of the Most High, when God was present in my life, when I experienced His presence, when I walked in His testimonies, this shall always remind, re remain in me. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. Have you ever felt that you are away from God, or God's presence is away from you? Use this formula that the psalmist here is using. Remember the days you walked with God. Remember the wondrous things that he has done. Remember the, the moments that he showed up when you cried to him. Remember the miracles he possessed, he, he did for you. Remember the healing you cried for and the Lord healed you. Remember the provisions that you're trusting God for and he provided for you. What does this do? Testimonies have got a way to awaken your faith. Knowing that the same God is still present and he can be able to do what he wants a deed in your life. Your way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the people. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O oh God, the waters saw you. They were afraid. The depths also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies sent out a sound. Your arrows also flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the wild wind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way, your way was, the sea, was the sea. Your path in the great waters. And your footsteps were not known. Verses 20 says, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Those who are God's people, those who are God's children, they have the privilege of being led by him. I will not stop quoting this scripture in Romans chapter number 8. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The people of God, they enjoy continuous divine direction by the help of the Holy Spirit. So the psalmist declares, this God was so great, but he had the opportunity to come down and help the children of Israel through the man called Moses and his brother Aaron to deliver them, to lead them, and to walk with them towards their destiny. I want to pray for you as we come to the end of our reading today. May that be your portion. God is not too busy. You can still enjoy his divine direction in your life today. Live, take some time off. Pursue him. Seek for him diligently in your night hours, in your day hours. Set some time aside 
and seek the presence and the glory of God in your life. And let him, as he led the children of Israel by the hand of Moses and Aaron, I declare, may he lead your life by the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. See you tomorrow, same time, same place. May the Lord watch over you. And above all, may you experience his leading in your life.